So hello everyone and welcome to Canvas Design for Change Week. Uh, my name is Enza and I'll be your host today. So this session is called Pitching Your Social Innovation and Impact, where we'll be learning to understand our audience and some effective communication techniques. So presenting today is Robin King, our Head of Social Impact at Canva. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Robin to begin. Thank you, Enza, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it's the morning in Australia, but I know we've got people joining us from everywhere all over the world. So um, thank you for wherever you are for uh, tuning in today. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. We are being recorded today. So what that means is that we'll be able to share these sessions with you uh, on our Canva Nonprofits landing page. Uh, later this week, and then you can share them on with anyone who you think might benefit from these or with colleagues or friends. So just before we begin, uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, Canva acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Uh, also, uh, as Enza mentioned, this is one, um, one session in a series of sessions that we're running this week uh, during Design for Change Week. And we've been completely inundated with Canva love for these sessions. You're one of about 3,500 people signed up today. And we've got over 40,000 nonprofits and social innovators joining us from around the world this week. So as much as we'd love to try and get to every single one of your questions, we know that won't be possible in this session. Do feel free to post them and we will have a Q&A session at the end um, section at the end of the session. But if your question isn't answered, I'd really encourage you to join our Canva Nonprofits Facebook group. It's called Canva Nonprofits Community when you search on Facebook. And by joining here, you can actually meet a cohort of um, like-minded nonprofits, social innovators and entrepreneurs working on really similar problems and issues to you. And Canva team is also in this um, group, so they can jump on and answer any questions that you might have. I am incredibly um, excited to be here today. Sorry, let's just go back. Um, my name is Robin, as you know by now, and uh, I'm the head of Canva's foundation. And what our mission is at Canva Foundation is to bring the best of Canva to help solve global challenges in the most impactful way possible. And part of that is offering our Canva product for free to nonprofits. So that's why we're really excited to be sharing our knowledge about our product and how to get the most of, out of it and communicate your impact and your ask effectively this week. So I'm really excited to be here and to be meeting each and every one of you because by the nature of your work, you are all change makers who have your own goal that you're trying to achieve. And so, because of this, you're part of Canva's core mission, which is empowering the world to design. And at Canva, we believe that design is for everyone. It's for, for eight-year-olds to 80-year-olds, from the biggest corporate, um, corporate companies in the world to, you know, two, two-person nonprofit. We work with teachers and students, um, small business owners, and we're really doubling down on our nonprofit work this week, um, running these sessions, but also uh, really working on how we can tweak our own Canva Nonprofits product. So our team is working on a variety of projects to improve this and make sure that it really caters to every need that the nonprofit sector has. So just a quick uh, overview of how we're going to run today's session. I'm going to start off by giving you a quick Canva tour, uh, showing you uh, how to navigate Canva and also find the templates that might be really relevant for your pitch and your presentation. Next, we'll learn how to really prepare your presentation, which is often the hardest part and what I'd encourage you to spend the most time doing. And if you do that really well, the design part, which we'll go through third, um, is relatively simple, especially in Canva. And then finishing off, we'll touch on presentation skills. And some of you may have joined an earlier session that we hosted, which was on pre presenting. So I'd also encourage you to watch that if you wanna um, really refine your presentation skills. So first up, uh, Canva resources and uh, where to find great pitch decks in Canva. 
And ju I just thought I'd uh, quickly flag for those who may not be aware that we do have the special Canva nonprofits offering. It's the Canva Pro product, which is our premium product that we give away completely free to all nonprofits. And what does this give you? Well, it gives you our premium features for free, and that's for up to 10 people in your organization. And I'm super excited to say that um, very soon we'll be implementing a discount for any um, members over 10. So if you are from a larger nonprofit or everyone in your um, organization uses Canva, you can very shortly get a discount of 50% for those members. So what do we mean by our premium features? Well, they're all listed on the screen here and I won't read them all out, but um, some of the most popular and most loved pro features are our un unlimited photos. Uh, you can you know, access a library of over 60 million photos, illustrations, and icons. Uh, people also love brand kits. So that's um, a tool you can use to upload all your fonts, your logo, your colors, and apply this uh, seamlessly across all of your designs. And then uh, magic resize is another favorite feature that people love that is a real time saver because you can instantly just resize any posts you have into a variety of different um, collateral and it uh, really does save you time. And here's a short video just to show you the, uh, the features and uh, how you can use these best. Okay, so when you sign up to uh, the Canva Nonprofits program, you're also joining a community of um, thousands of other nonprofits around the world. Currently, we have over 60,000 nonprofits in our community. And um, as I flagged earlier, we've got a really active Facebook group. So um, in the Facebook group, you can ask each other questions, but then Canva also posts lots of tips and tricks. So it's a great forum to be part of, and I'd encourage any of you who are not already a member to join. Another great resource I'd encourage you to check out is our design school. So on design school, we have a bunch of short courses and tutorials that you can do to really level up your skills. And I know um, that there's probably such a variety of people in the audience today. Some of you have really in-depth skills and then some would really like to know the basics of branding and marketing and design school is a great uh, place to get started and um, super short bite-sized courses, which are easily digestible when you only have half an hour of time. Great way to kind of level up some skills. So now getting a bit more on topic for today, uh, we're here to talk about presentations and pitches and Canva is a great tool to use when creating a pitch deck. We've got over 500 professional templates that you can customize and make your own. And um, you can find these by just going onto the Canva homepage, searching for our templates, and then typing in presentations. And as you'll see, um, I've highlighted that we have specific, specific pitch deck um, presentations. So these are really beautiful and um, very easily easy to customize. Um, but I also wanted to emphasize how they're not just pretty, they're not just um, you know, nice to look at. We've done deep research into what makes an effective pitch. And uh, some of the organizations that we've based this research on, uh, one is Y Combinator. They fund early stage startups and they've listened to pitch after pitch after pitch. So they really know what makes an effective um, argument and effective presentation. So um, yeah, just to give you an idea, I guess they've funded 2000 startups and listened to thousands and thousands more um, pitches. So I guess in the, in the templates that we have, we have a lot of instructive text and merely by following that text and filling in exactly what it tells you to do um, in terms of problem, market size, solution, you really, at the end of, the end of that, you've come out with a pretty, um, pretty good deck that's almost ready to go. 
Uh, another, f uh, just a, some quick tips before we dive into the a body of the presentation. Here are some handy things that can save you time when you're doing your pitch on the run and sort of on your way out the door trying to quickly finish things off. Uh, you hit R for rectangle, T for text, L for line, and command brackets for forward and back. So now, getting on to the most important section, what makes a good presentation or pitch? And I'd really encourage you to spend a lot of time thinking about this, because this is the tricky bit. Um, turning to the experts to hear what they have to say. Seth Godden is an author, and he really believes in no more than six words on a slide ever. So one point per slide. We've then got Guy Kawasaki, who swears by the 10, 20, 30 rule. 10 is a, a slide deck should never have more than 10 slides. It should never go for more than 20 minutes, which I'm breaking today. So <laughs> and then it should never have font that is smaller than 30 size. Uh, Gar, Gar Reynolds believes that um, slides are only scenery, not a teleprompter. And then Tony Robbins, and I really like this one, is that information without emotion is not retained. So be genuine, create human connection, and just be yourself. And now coming a bit closer to home, you've seen Guy, Guy Kawasaki on the last side, slide, but he's actually the chief brand strategist for Canva and he gives hundreds of keynotes, keynote speeches every year. And then we've got Melanie Perkins, who's Canva's CEO. Um, and she also has, um, she speaks publicly all the time and has really spent many years refining what a good pitch looks like now. So uh, a lot of the advice that we'll give to Day is based on learnings that we've had from these two amazing speakers and um, how they've refined their pitches and their presentations over the years. Here's some advice from Guy. One of the things that I always try to do in a speech is to sell a dream. Selling a dream means that you're talking about how your product, your service, your book, your idea makes the world a better place. Macintosh empowered people to use computers. Canva has democratized design. It's the high road, it's the big picture benefit, a uh, crucial part of every speech. Okay, so I think that brings us to the point of you really thinking about what is, what is that dream you're trying to sell? What's your goal when you step up to do a presentation to whoever your audience is? So think deeply about this. Um, is it about attracting investment? Are you trying to sign up new partners or attract um, others to work with you? Is it about getting volunteers or recruiting the best um, staff members? Whatever your goal is, really clearly define that. Um, and once you've got your goal, then it's about crafting your story to achieve that goal. So I'd encourage you to sit down and do some brainstorming on your own or with other team members. And um, this is super important before you then launch into drafting your pitch. So what's your purpose? What's your idea in one sentence, which is hard to do, but you've got to make yourself do it. Then what's the, ben what's the problem? Um, who are the beneficiaries or who are the users whose pain points that you're solving for? And then what's your solution? How are you going to make these beneficiaries' lives better? And um, then you need to explain the size of this problem. What's the market size? What's the problem size here? Uh, it's re then really helpful to highlight your plan, but keep it really high level. Three is a bit of a magic number. So what are three features that you'd really like to call out about your plan or your intervention? And then um, people invest in people often, not, you know, people can sell ideas. So who's your team? Who are the um, amazing people who are actually going to bring this idea and this solution to life? And it's super important to um, communicate how they can do that and um, sell your team. So let's look at some examples from some well-known companies. Airbnb is um, a brand that a lot of us have used, pre-pandemic possibly, <laughs> but um, they've done this really well. Uh, they're about booking rooms with locals rather than hotels. They size up the problem in relation to price, hotels, and um, no kind of easy way to connect um, people wanting to stay in other people's homes. They have a solution, which is a platform where users can rent out their space to host travelers. And they kind of list three quick benefits from that solution. They've sized up the market size and really show a lot of information in such a simple 
slide. So they've actually really thought about that. They then show their solution and it's really nice to show a bit of a product demo or what this might look like. Um, they already have an MVP there. Well, this is, you know, now, but um, pre-launch, pre they would have shown a demo of their product and then they've got their team. And now moving to a more social sector example, Watsi is a company or a platform that funds healthcare for people around the world. They've sized up their problem in that half the world lacks access to essential health services and 100 million people are still pushed into extreme poverty because of health expenses. Their solution is a platform that can connect everyone to healthcare that they deserve, where you can meet a patient and then donate monthly to do this. They've sized up the issue. There are 800 million people who still spend at least 10% of their household budget on health expenses. And for almost 100 million people, this forces them to survive on just $1.90 or less a day. Their approach is really uh, simple and clean. You meet a patient, you fund their healthcare, and then you get an email telling you once they've received this healthcare. And then they've outlined their team and their, their funders and their leadership. So once you've um, spent the time really developing up um, your preparation, designing is somewhat easy. Uh, you, you've, you've got all the content and you're ready to go. And this is where Canva can really help you. So the three things to bear in mind are keep it legible, keep it simple and keep it obvious. And we'll run through some pointers on how to achieve each of those. So what do we mean by legible? Well, you wanna create a sense of consistency in your presentation. So this includes your type, your colors, and uh, the, the imagery that you use. So select this at the get-go. Often it's based on your brand. And if you came along, we, we run a really good workshop on introduction to designing for change, which really helps you develop those brand fundamentals if you, if you don't have a strong brand already. So, this might be based on your brand um, font and colors, and then select a bunch of imagery that you'll use consistently throughout that presentation. But that's going to create a really nice flow to the whole feel of your presentation. Uh, next up is finding your type. And you may have a type already for your brand, but if you don't, we've got some great tools in Canva that are really fun to use actually. And this is our typography made easy tool. You can find these on the Canva homepage. You just navigate to the bottom and there's a resources tab where we list all of these um, extra resources. So you can upload, say you have a font that you really like, you can upload that and it will match. Um, it'll show you some fonts that really pair nicely with that. And when selecting your type, especially for a presentation, readability matters most. And this is a super clear easy to read slide, as you can see. We really recommend going for sans, which is a uh, very common text in digital, and it's clean and modern. Whereas serif on the left is more classic and traditional, and that's really common in print, and it's got the little caps on it. So select sans varieties in all of your presentations. And we're just gonna run through a few examples here to kind of demonstrate how the choice of uh, typography can actually really affect the readability of a slide. Um, the first one, the white one, is really curly, um, lots of different types, and it's serif, whereas on the right, it's super like snappy, and you can very clearly um, read that, and your eyes follow it nicely. Now we're gonna talk about how you can actually use different types of font to draw your attention, um, to different uh, messages that you're trying to get across on a page. So we've got page breakers, we've got body text, and then we've got subtext. And by page breaker, this is what we mean. It's kind of moving on to a new idea and um, I guess showing, showing your readers that it's a pause and you're entering a new part of your presentation. Your viewers, sorry, not your readers. Um, so page breakers tend to be bigger for emphasis and they're usually obviously on their own. <laughs> uh, this is body text and body text is a bit smaller, but it's still big enough to be easily readable right at the back of the room. Um, you know, if I'm on my tippy toes at the back trying to read that slide, I can still read that. And you can also kind of emphasize words by just changing the typography. 
And then subtext is a lot smaller, like this one at the bottom. And this is just to show you how it really does um, affect the readabil readability, the different type of typography that you choose. So here we've got, um, we've got script fonts, which are really difficult to read in longer sentences, especially when the font size is super small. It's a bit difficult to read, isn't it? Um, and then here you can see again, we've got the long, long, long sentence of small, um, of small script, uh, whereas in the one on the right, the body text is a lot easier to read. And then small subtext, keep it super short and punchy um, because no one is going to be able to read it if you put a massive paragraph in there. So that brings us, I guess we've started diving into this, but into hierarchy to really emphasize the key messages that you're trying to get across. Um, too often people just put a whole heap of text on a, on a slide and it's, you're really making the reader work hard, uh, sorry, the viewer work hard. So think about what it is, what's the key message you're trying to get across on that slide and then utilize hierarchy to um, convey that message. So on this slide, we've, we say we've served over 5,000 meals, 95% increase in beneficiaries. So the thing that jumps out to me here is 95% increase in beneficiaries. And um, so really think about it. If the, the point you wanted to get across more was the 5,000 meals, make that bigger, you know. Um, it sounds obvious, but I think we sometimes don't um, actually pay much attention to that. And just a handy tip, make sure font is always bigger than 30 plus. Uh, if you have to, go to 24 for footnotes, but avoid it where possible. And then have a max of four sizes and use them consistently. And here's an example. So you have your extra large type, which can be used for page breakers. You have large type, medium type, and then small type for more body copy. And then if you need to, you can have that fifth level for footnotes. So people always read the biggest, boldest text first. And then they may read the bit underneath and then they may read the bit to the side. <laughs> and I guess here's a good example. Uh, the one on the left is all level. It's all the same. Whereas when we kind of pull out a sentence, people will read that first. And then they might read the underneath bit and then the bit in the corner. So another way to um, emphasize things is through contrast. And again, if you... Um, don't know much about color or you want to learn more about color, Canva does have some great tools. And this is one of my favorite tools, our color tool. We've got a color palette generator, which is awesome. You can upload any photo. Um, doesn't have to be a Canva photo. You just drag and drop it to this tool and it will give you a suite of colors that complement that photo. So say there's some amaz amazing brand imagery that you just got done. Um, Canva can help you, I guess, select the, the colors to use in that presentation. Uh, we've got some color palette ideas and a color wheel, which um, tells you, I guess, how to find colors and pair different colors together effectively. And then color meanings is super interesting. So um, you're all in the line of work where um, you're, the subject matter can often evoke a lot of emotions. And so what are the type of emotions you're trying to invoke and how can you actually utilize color to do that more effectively? So super interesting to go and have a look around. And the reason color is so important for a presentation is that you should really focus on choosing a maximum of four hues. You should have a light, a dark, and then two accents. And um, you, you can, um, if you kind of feel that's a bit limiting, there's a really great tool in Canva that's a little transparency slider. It's like a little um, four little, it's a little cube. Um, and you just slide that and you can kind of um, yeah, increase transparency and it really makes text pop. And I'll show you a few examples here. So um, this is in the tool. If you click on the color, say you select your background or the color of a font, it will pop up on the side with the brand colors. If you've um, saved your brand colors in Canva, it will then give you some palette options. So a neutral palette, an expressive palette, a gradient palette. And then if you've uploaded photos to your presentation, um, you can see on the right here that we've got um, colors that suit the photos that I've included. So it's a great way to kind of um, make a start. 
And here we're looking at contrast. So the yellow block, it's um, you know really good contrast with the blue text and it pops, whereas the red is a, a far more similar color to the orange and it doesn't really pop. It's harder to read um, and not as effective. And we're also working on some great tools coming soon um, to help people who are colorblind. So watch this space. Um, here's another example of um, contrast. So the one on the left, it's, it's kind of too similar. The background is quite white. The text doesn't pop at all. Whereas um, the darker colors on the, on the right, um, the white really pops and stands out. So think about that because, you know, if people can't read your slide, it's not much good. Next, we're going to keep it simple. So I think um, what I've seen time and time again is that you're so deeply invested in your work and your idea that you know it's really good. You know the ins and outs. You know why it's a good idea. You've thought deeply about it. Um, but the tricky thing is that you have to make others understand this and make it super easy for them to understand and do this really quickly. And I think the added complexity for a nonprofit or a social innovator is that you're working um, with pretty complex ideas and um, complex solutions. And you also have to explain your social cause as a return on investment, especially when you're pitching. Um, but the thing to keep coming back to is less is more. Um, people can always ask questions. You've got to get them interested first. You've got to hook them in. Um, and often you can do that by keeping it short. And I think going back to Guy's point on 20 minutes, like we need to be able to explain our ideas to eight-year-olds um, and cut out the jargon and just keep it simple. So what do we mean by simple ideas? Well, they're really easy to understand. So keep coming back to how can I take this complex um, problem or this complex solution that I'm working on and make it really simple. They're also not intertwined with other ideas. And this is something um, I think we all can struggle with at times. Um, you know, the, they're not simple, these solutions. So we kind of start explaining the next point, but take on one point at a time, one point per slide. Um, and then also don't include every bit of detail. Like I said, people can, once you've hooked them in and they're interested in what you have to say, they can ask you questions. They can dive deeper into the details. So it's great to have done that research and have that knowledge ready to go, but you don't need to say that all up front. You'll probably end up boring people. Um, so yeah, have that as backup um, and show that you're prepared, but you don't need to demonstrate that all on a slide. Um, wherever you can, be really clear and specific. And to do this, uh, it's really powerful to show, not tell. So here are some examples. And um, say we're trying to explain a youth savings program. And this is a fairly clear slide. I've got a max of six bullet points, which is really, you don't want to have more than six bullet points on a slide. Um, it's just too much information to digest on one slide. I've kept it pretty short and snappy. Um, but this could be a lot more powerful by showing and um, visualizing this. Uh, people have different ways of digesting information. So um, I guess every, everyone does um, interpret things differently, but infographics are a really powerful way of showing a lot of information in a fairly easily digestible format. And um, yeah, as you, can say, as you can see, there's even more information than was included on the previous slide in a smaller kind of more compact um, way. And in Canva, we do have a suite of infographics. Uh, so you can search infographics on the homepage and we also have charts. So on the object panel, there's a little icon that has charts where you can input a bunch of data and it will spit out a great chart for you. And um, yeah, again, coming back to show, don't tell. That's a pretty clear slide, the white one, which is we give skills to over 35 million people each month. But then I'm actually putting some faces to that number and um, bringing that human connection to that slide, which is always really um, powerful. And last but not least, keep it obvious. So like I said, listeners have a short um, attention span. I think we can all relate to this. You zone out, you start thinking about what you're making for dinner, you look at your phone. So keep it punchy, um, you know, you'd rather them wanting to know more at the end than bored and zoned out. 
So don't miss that short attention span. With obvious slides, they need to be understood at a glance. And like I said, everyone has different ways of interpreting information. So think about all the different um, variety of people who might be in your audience. They need to be really explicit and they need to make sure that they're not making me as a viewer work hard. You really need to call out the messages and you do the work for the viewer. So going back to our youth savings program, this is a pretty obvious slide. I've said three things that facilitate youth savings. It's support from parents, it's support from schools, and it's taking banks to the youth. And I've put some icons in there. So there's not really any way to misinterpret that slide. Um, if you're sharing data, then make the insight easy to understand. And um, this is a hard one actually, and many people fail to do this. And also make sure there is only one data insight per slide. So what do we mean by this? Well, here we've got a slide which, it's a clear slide, but I don't really know what I'm meant to be looking for here. Like, what is this telling me? Um, it's listing a bunch of interventions, it's showing a timeline, and then it's showing a bunch of um, money. But what if I add a title to this, revenue reached over 270 million. It's really, really clear. I'm not making the audience um, try and interpret this and they could come away with a variety of different interpretations. I'm telling them what I want them to take away from this slide. And keep coming back to making complex things simple through any data that you want to share. So in this table, I've listed um, some dates, um, some months, and then the number of students per month. And it's students impacted per month. It's fairly obvious. But also, what is the conclusion I'm wanting the audience to draw here? Whereas now, you can see I've really um, just teased that out and said May was our first month with over 30 million students. And again, I guess that was a deduction they could draw from the previous slide, but may not necessarily draw. And if I looked at that, I probably wouldn't think that. I'd just be trying to sort of navigate that bunch of numbers. So make it really simple. But um, you have the added complexity as a nonprofit or a social innovator or an entrepreneur that you need to communicate your impact as well as your idea really simply. And it's not as easy as selling goods and services or um, products and um, sizing up the market size. You've really got to, um, yeah, a lot of it comes down to the way that you present and connect with your audience because a lot of um, social causes, they just inevitably are tied to emotional reactions. So going back to Y Combinator, who's the company that invests in early stage startups, let's listen to some advice that they have for people pitching. The most important thing, and this will sound obvious, but um, clarity. You would be shocked how few pitches are sensible. First is don't think about it like a pitch. I think founders too often think about this like comical, like, hey, now let me tell you about this great idea. That's not, that's not how, that's not what a pitch is. A pitch is really is the most concise way to describe your business and why it should be interesting to, you know, to the person sitting across the table. It's shocking how many pitches I don't really understand. And they're never the good companies. Um, if you really, spent a lot of time in idea. If you really have a, a big new insight uh, and you're really thoughtful about it, it usually only takes a couple of sentences to paint that picture in someone else's head. What I realized going through so many interviews is that fundamentally like the founders who are straightforward, who are just answering the question that's provided and who if they don't know, they say they don't know, they go a lot further. Can I explain this in plain words that anyone can understand? And that I really think that there's a, if there's any pitch that you cannot explain in plain words, there's a, it's a really bad sign. The easiest way to do this as a founder is you should say one or two lines about your company to somebody. Don't tell them you're a founder and then see if they can repeat back what the company does. One of the things that we teach when presenting on Demo Day and one of the things that I harp on specifically is that just because you're given a couple minutes to speak doesn't mean you should take it all. And the impact of your words go up the fewer words you say. 
So the best companies are able to really explain things in a concise manner, stay on track, and when they don't know something, they say they don't know it. Usually a good interview or a good pitch, you start off like open-minded, and then if the founder is able to tell a good story and they're able to present a narrative that makes sense, you, follow, you, you go with them wherever they're gonna go. And if you follow yourself falling into the story and like not looking at the time or not, like if, if all of a sudden all, everything falls away and you're going with them on the story, just like a good movie or something, right? That's a good pitch. A good interview works like a conversation where you teach us something and convince us that what you're working on can be a multi-billion dollar company. And a bad interview looks like anything else. So I think there's some really powerful tips in there um, about how to really approach a pitch with the right mindset and bring clarity. And um, as they all kind of emphasize, you've got to say it simply, not use any jargon. So Y Combinator does fund, majority of the companies they fund are for-profits, but they do have a select um, nonprofit cohort. And the things that they really look for when selecting nonprofits into their program, the team, that's the most important thing. They need to be able to trust and believe that this team can solve whatever they're setting out to do. Um, they really look for a big problem that they're trying to solve and then an equally big solution to address this. And they have to have some runs on the board. They have to show that they've um, got a provable program and um, I guess tested this in some way already. And then also um, super important is a culture and values fit that they look for. So I think everything that was said in that um, video before is really true and really relevant to um, the nonprofit sector just as much as the for-profit se sector. But I do think that you also have to approach um, pitches and presentations and um, any opportunity you get to share your story and to share your business or your idea with people as a relationship building exercise and um, Going back to that first, first slide where information isn't retained without emotion and connection. And I think that can be a really powerful tool for you to leverage um, because a lot of your work uh, does create, it does incite emotion. And I think you really need to leverage that and draw on that in the way that you pitch and connect with your audience. And um, here is a bit of advice from um, Layla, she founded Samasource, which is an um, impact sourcing model which aims to lift people out of extreme poverty um, through employment, um, particularly in AI. And she's got some really um, good advice about how she really hates um, pitching and public speaking and how she approaches it. didn't want charity, they want work and opportunity, just like you and I want. The only solution to global poverty is dignified work. Fundraising is so hard. Uh, I'm actually an introvert, even though I have to give speeches and talk to people all the time, I find it really uh, uncomfortable. So my, my main piece of advice is to think about fundraising and media work and kind of everything you do as relationship building. So ultimately, you're trying to connect with the people who could potentially support your work. You're not trying to sell them or pitch them, you're trying to forge a friendship with them. And if you can see them as potential guides, um, advisors, mentors, friends, the money, I, I think, tends to come most often after that initial connection has been made. And especially when you're not coming from a place of desperation, but a place of calm confidence, you will come across as more genuine and less pitchy. Um, and I think pitching, even though it's so tempting to do that when you're desperate for funding, can have the adverse effect of making someone less likely to support your work. As you can see, uh, Layla really uh, emphasizes the importance of human connection and relationship building whenever you get the chance to stand up and talk. And I think um, a super powerful way to do that is using stories and putting a face to the kind of macro level of the problem that you're trying to solve. So um, here's a quote from Malala uh, and she says, I tell my story not because it is unique but because it is the story of many girls, but actually sharing a very personal story that then reflects the plight of hundreds of millions of girls around the world is incredibly powerful. So how can you tell your story? Well, um, 
you can communicate the positive impact from your project or your organization and the beneficiaries who you're helping in a variety of ways. You can share um, you can share data and stats and bring that to life by infographics. You can share visuals. So photos are a really powerful way to share stories and evoke emotion. Um, quotes are really great too um, and kind of bringing someone's personal story to life. And yeah, just bringing it back to an individual all the time can be anchoring and powerful. So um, here's an example from water.org and they've done a really great job, I think, on this slide of showing how the work they're doing is affecting 29 million people globally, but then they've put a face to that and they um, have introduced you to Rihanna and told her personal story and how, um, how they've improved access to safe water for her at her home. So kind of um, zoning out or zoning in from the macro level um, to show an individual story. I also think a really um, important part of your presentation is to communicate the return on investment. And it's in line with, I guess, sizing up the market and the problem size, but it's also something that I think nonprofits often struggle to do. And um, people still, I, I don't think it's any excuse to be a not-for-profit not and um, not show the value of your investment. A dollar is a dollar, whether you're putting that into a um, commercial investment or into a nonprofit cause or organization. So I guess, show visually or communicate it um, through a story, the impact of that dollar and how it's going to um, be used along your journey. And then it's also really helpful to include third party validators. And um, I think it's something we all do. If we can see other names or other people trust someone, we're more likely to trust that um, proposed solution or idea or organization. So if you do have some great partners, it's really powerful to highlight those and to include them in any um, pitch uh, that you're doing. It might not be partners as such, it might be mentors or people on your board, but just show the names of people who are involved who really um, believe in your cause and have got behind you. And last but not least, delivery is super important and it really matters. And I think um, if you attended this morning's talk, there was a lot of uh, information on how to become a more confident speaker, but it is something that uh, practice makes perfect. So if you're not a confident speaker, all hope is not lost, you can definitely get there. And there are so many tactics you can use to improve your public speaking. And here are a few words of advice from Guy. We're gonna tell you how to present with confidence. Have you ever watched a presenter with admiration or maybe envy? They own the stage with confidence. They look so relaxed, like they've never felt nerves in their life. They seem more qualified on their subject than anyone, ever. How do they do it? I have about three or four main topics that I cover, 50 to 75 times a year. So some of these speeches I've literally given hundreds of times. And after hundreds of times, I'm completely confident in them, but it took hundreds of times. When it comes to presenting with confidence, the secret sauce is practice, practice, present. Practice until you're sick of it, and then practice some more. And don't just read your notes over and over again. Practice by standing up, projecting your slides on the wall, holding a clicker in your hand, and imagining that there are hundreds of people out there listening to you. Steve Jobs wasn't a natural speaker, but he worked really, really hard at it. He rehearsed his presentations with obsessive detail until eventually he got it down to a fine art. So don't just wing it. Put in the time to prepare, and you will present with confidence too. Thanks for watching. Check out our next episode. So that was just one of the modules from our presentations to um, impress, uh, presentations to impress um, session on Canva Design School. So I'd really encourage you to jump in if you enjoyed that and check out all the other lessons that we have. And I thought I'd end by sharing Canva's first pitch deck. And it's actually really interesting when you take a look at it. So it's obviously a lot more beautiful now being designed in Canva. This was designed in PowerPoint back in the day. But the really interesting thing about this pitch deck is that the content hasn't changed that much. 
So Mel and Cliff, um, when they created this uh, about 10 years ago in Perth, in Mel's mum's lounge room, when this was still a seed of an idea, they'd done their research. They had a really, they'd done their preparation really, really, really well. And um, they really had a lot of insight into the problem that they were trying to solve for and what their solution was. So they identified that we were currently in the era of desktop publishing that only pros could um, be part of this era. There was a massive gap in the market. And they believe that Canva could become the solution to this gap. A really simple design solution like nothing ever seen before. They showed how we'd done this before and how Canva could really catapult us into a cloud publishing era. They showed, I guess, how this would look and gave some real examples of what their product would look like and also captured their team and their investors. So I guess the interesting thing is that, um, yeah, if you really spend the time investing in uh, thinking about the message you want to get across, what your ultimate goal is, um, hopefully you can create a really powerful pitch deck that if you look back in, you know, this is about 10 years ago, uh, a lot of that core message still stays true. So it'd be interesting for you to even dig up some old presentations or docs you have sharing your message and go back and have a look at that. And um, yeah, I guess think about what is this massive, massive problem we're trying to solve? How do we communicate it really, really simply? And how do we create this kind of long-term vision and get others excited about that? So that brings me to the conclusion of our presentation today. And um, I just wanted to end by saying we really do feel like we're only 1% of the way there. Uh, we're really starting to build out our nonprofit product, but we'd love to hear your feedback and get your ideas around how we can uh, really enhance the product to better serve your needs as a nonprofit and help you um, create more impact wherever you are and whatever you're doing. So now over to Q&A, and I think Enza is going, to, she's um, been monitoring the chat and she's gonna call out a few of the great questions that you've all been sharing. Someone um, said recently, in the current climate, it's hard to get opportunities to pitch. Do we have any great ideas to share on how to maximize these opportunities? Hmm. That is a really interesting question, I think. Um, I guess I, yeah, I don't have deep knowledge into the different forums. I don't know where you are in the world, but there are lots of um, different programs like the Y Combinator program where they do uh, have intakes for not-for-profits um, and many others like that that support um, early stage startups. So depending on what your idea is and the kind of funding that you're trying to raise, I'd encourage you to just do some research into your market and um, look at the different programs and... Um, I guess, grants and different uh, varieties of uh, capital that you can access in your market for the problem you're trying to solve. So I think it can be quite um, specific on the jurisdiction you're in. But yes, I realise it is definitely a challenging time. It is. Thanks, Robin. Uh, okay, so we have a few more questions pouring through now. Um, how much is too much when it comes to colour schemes on your presentation deck? Any advice for us, Robin? Uh, so like we said earlier, uh, we'd kind of recommend a max of four hues. So light, dark, and then two accents. And depends what your brand is, I think. Like if you're this crazy psychedelic brand, you might want to just go with that. Um, but it can create a bit of like turmoil <laughs> for, for people trying to um, navigate through your presentation. So Four is kind of like the magic number we say, but of course it's up to you and the kind of um, mood that you're trying to convey through your presentation. Thank you. Okay, there's one from Cecilia that says, could you please help us with some topics that you think will really captivate the investor and get their attention? Again, I think that really depends on what, the work is that you're trying, what the impact is or the program is that you're trying to um, get across. But like I said, I think um, some of the points from Y Combinator were like, show a really big problem and then a really big solution. So 
if you're just tackling a tiny little portion of a problem, I wouldn't get too excited about, you know, I, I, I'd like to see, see scale. I'd like to see um, how, as I said, every dollar I invest can have this ripple effect. So I'd kind of show how, um, yeah, you're approaching this with scalability in mind. The, the problems that all of you are trying to tackle are massive and complex in nature and um, they're wicked problems. They're always changing. So I think show how you're taking a more kind of macro long-term approach to these. Like I think that is really powerful and would hook any potential investor in showing that you're not taking a short-termist approach. Um, you're looking at this from um, the big picture and how you can actually build this and scale this as you prove out your solution. Thank you all so much for joining us today. A huge thank you to Robin for all your words of wisdom. Thank you all for coming. It's been really great having you and great to meet you and good luck in your Canva journey.